I'm pleased to welcome Jeff Story up to the stage. He's going to be talking about running Terraform at scale with hundreds, hundreds of AWS accounts. Welcome, Jeff. So yes, as Jack mentioned, I'm going to be talking about running Terraform at a very large scale. Um, while a lot of the things we're going to talk about today are going to be AWS specific, the tooling and methodology really isn't. So this can apply to any cloud provider that you might be using. Um, you know, Capital One, we use Terraform for a lot of different things. We provision instances, do deployments. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today is what we call our VPC bones. And that's all the things that we build to let the application teams deliver applications on top of it. So that's VPCs, subnets, NACLs, Route 53 domains, and all the things we need to do to get it ready. And many of you who have used Terraform probably said, okay, I can just spin up a VPC. It's not that hard. Um, we'll talk about why that's hard at Capital One. Um, specifically, we're going to talk about what challenges did we have at this scale, why we chose Terraform, how that helps us out, some of the tooling that we built around Terraform, some of which is open source, some of which is not, uh, but the methodology can apply even if you don't have our tools here. And then what are we, what are we doing going forward? Uh, you know, there, there's a lot to still do. We're still early on in our journey in Capital One to the cloud, so still a lot of work to be done. Uh, so when we talk about managing at scale, I want to talk about some of the different challenges that we have, but before we get into that, everyone has a different definition of what scale actually is. We can talk about it in terms of requests coming in, um, but I really want to talk about what our organi organizational scale looks like. So from a, a company perspective, you know, we have millions of customers, we have literally billions of dollars coming through our accounts. But internally, we have a huge development community. We're on the order of 6,000 developers across Capital One uh, who are running across literally hundreds of VPCs, hundreds of accounts, multiple regions. It really is a 24 by 7 deployment operation. And this isn't just for applications that are external facing. It's all of our data analytics, internal processing. So my role as part of a centralized operations team who builds out this network stack is how do we serve these customers the same way we serve our external customers? Because any slowdowns are really problematic for everyone at Capital One. And if anyone's worked on an ops team like this, you know it's kind of just people throwing darts at you all the time. So how do we get this right? So the first thing we really talked about is we really need to move fast. Um, our whole ops team is under 100 people. While that may sound large, it, it's still, this is for running all of our internal infrastructure, whether it's things like GitHub and Artifactory, as well as running a lot of our data center. Um, and a lot of the things we did manually in the data center just don't scale very well. So when we first started out moving into AWS, probably about two or three years ago, it would take upwards of you know, four or five weeks to get a new environment provisioned. And developers will tend to just do what they need to do to make things work which meant we had all sorts of things running in different environments where they didn't belong. Um, and at the same time, with new apps spinning up in the cloud, we're also going through this massive migration where we're moving literally thousands of apps from the data center. So the scale of what we're trying to do is just really, really large. Um, and you know, trying to train people up who aren't necessarily cloud native at the same time poses, poses a lot of challenges. So in addition to being fast, we need to be consistent. And this is particularly important when we're talking across all these accounts. Debugability becomes very hard when things drift over time. Uh, it's really easy to just log into the AWS console and make a quick change. But now why does your east region look a little bit different than your west region? And when you actually have to fail over, this becomes a really hard thing to do. Um, it also makes it easier to move workloads. So a team gets started in a dev environment, needs to promote to a QA environment. So all in all, we just want everything to be consistent and, re and really look the same. Uh, security, we're a bank. Uh, security is really important to us. We have a lot of people's data and we want to keep it that way. So there's a few key things about security which actually ties well into some of the security talks we heard this morning. Uh, we need to have granular permissions models and understand who makes changes. So for example, the people who can change the Capital One Edge firewalls are very different than the people who can change a dev environment code. But we don't necessarily want it to be a central group who bottlenecks for everybody. So how do we distribute this but be responsible? And how do we make sure that all of our changes are auditable? And this helps our security architecture network really understand what, what's going on. Uh, and then we also need to be able to recover from disasters. Uh, disasters can happen for a variety of reasons. Sometimes they are human-caused disasters. Somebody logs in, does something they haven't. I mean, I've certainly been the cause of some of these disasters. Uh, and, but it's also data centers go out. Uh, you know, there was an S3 outage. Not that that's what we should always be planning for. But we need to be able to figure out how to quickly spin up these new environments. And that goes all back to the consistency, security, speed. So we want to be prepared for these disasters before they actually happen. So it's easier to fail over when it does. 
Uh, so at a high level, those are the problems. And everybody's heard this buzzword before, infrastructure as code. But what does it really mean? And for us, it means really treating our infrastructure code the same way we do application code. And that's not just about building scripts that do your automation, because what you can end up with quickly is a collection of scripts and a collection of instructions that say, run this script, run this script, run this script. And we call that more manual automation. So it's a lot of things that have to be done in the right order. It doesn't work so well. Um, it's really treating infrastructure the same way we would treat our app code. So that means testing, using code reviews, pull requests, modularizing, and all the things you would do, not, not copying and pasting everywhere. Uh, and Terraform was really helpful in getting us to this point. So we're gonna talk about why we chose Terraform. And there are, you know, there's lots of options here, whether you're in AWS using CloudFormation, Google Cloud using their templating language, tools like Troposphere, and any other sort of generator languages. But there are a few key elements of Terraform that really made us choose it. So the first one being it was purposefully built for doing this sort of work. Uh, JSON quickly gets out of hand, YAML's a little bit better, but even simple things like comments, uh, as our Terraform code base starts to grow, just being able to read what we wrote is, is much nicer. Um, you can see here, even if you've never seen Terraform code before, it's pretty obvious what's going on here. We're using AWS, we're creating a security group called Sample, and it's got a, some tags on it. Uh, super easy to read and write. Now, the modularity is really big, and it goes back to the consistency, and I'll talk about how this works with the tooling we built around it. But modularity is a real big piece of what we've done, and it's all about creating central collections of modules that can be reused. So this is a simple example of how we might deploy the same code from, from to east and west, but we'll also do this across east, west, multiple regions, multiple environments, and how the tooling we built will show how we can actually promote those changes across the environments, so you end up with a very consistent set of environments. Uh, the Terraform plan. This is super important to everything we do from a review perspective. Uh, you can't really blue-green network deployment so well. Uh, if you want to change a, a port or a, a, something coming inbound from the edge, you better get that right the first time. So not only do we use this for our developers to figure out what they're going to change, we integrate the plan into our review process so that our architecture team, security teams, can understand what's about to happen. We've actually gone ahead and enhanced some of the plan capability by parsing it out and building something a little bit more human readable that maybe people who aren't as familiar with reading the code can actually read. And it makes, it makes our security teams much happier and makes things move much smoother. Uh, multiple cloud providers, as I said, we're predominantly working in AWS, but as we build the tooling, we don't want to lock into a specific cloud provider. So the nice part about Terraform is that everything we've done, you may have to have different constructs for the different environments, but it makes it easier to use the same processes across different clouds. Um, and lastly, just about open source. And this one's kind of interesting when you hear a bank being open source. Uh, a lot of what we're doing at Capital One is really around consuming open source, but also producing open source. So part of the tools I'm gonna to talk about today are open source. And this has been for both technical reasons. It makes it easier for us to commit things back if, if for some reason Terraform doesn't do what we want it to do. Uh, it makes it easier for our security group to be able to review what's going on. So all in all, Capital One has really been embracing an open source first culture, uh, which has made lives easier, easier for the developers here. So I'm gonna talk about for the, the rest of the time here, because I know I don't have a lot of it, is around a product that we call Nimbus, which is what we built internally. Uh, it stands for the Network Infrastructure Management Bus, and it's a cloud, so we found it to be appropriate. Uh, it's really a suite of tools uh, that it, and both a workflow for secure approvals that we use now to deploy a lot of our network infrastructure, including security groups for our application teams, as well as we use this to deploy all of our VPC infrastructure across all of Capital One now. Uh, so there's a few fundamentals before we get into the actual, actual code here. So the first one I've talked about quite a bit is that we, we really want to treat our infrastructure code like application code. But the next one's kind of interesting is about creating GitHub repositories is what we call our unit of infrastructure. And what this means is that we deploy an entire repository at a time. So it means we're gonna end up with hundreds if not thousands of repositories, but it's a group of infrastructure that gets deployed together. So that might be a VPC for an environment, it might be a team security groups, but it always goes out together. And this way we don't have any question, well, was this module deployed or was this module deployed? And that's how we've done this from a repository perspective. Uh, you know, in the ops world, and even in the development world, there has been kind of this anti-pattern we've called the copy, paste, mutate. It's we have some scripts, we copy them, we paste them, we change them a little bit. Now we have hundreds of files that are similar but different. And that's something we really wanted to avoid. And you'll see this all ties back to sort of modularity and the consistency, and obviously how Terraform fits into this. 
the workflow piece of it is very important. It's not just about building tools that can deploy code. It's how do we actually integrate it into this process? Because as you can imagine, working at a bank, we do have a lot of security processes, as, as we should. But how do we take some of that older, older world mindset of everything's got to go through a central team, horizontally scale it out, but still make sure it's secure and make sure that our customers' data is, is safe? Uh, and the last thing is really about being API driven. So when we originally started building the tool suite, it was a bunch of command line tools, which we now have the command line tools that talk to our APIs. But we found that teams were finding interesting ways to integrate with our products that we were building, uh, whether they were through Slack bots, through Jenkins pipelines, whatever it might be, we wanted to make sure that we're providing APIs to make sure our developer experience is as good as we would like it to be. Uh, so what does Nimbus actually look like? So we talked about the repository piece. Uh, the repositories, we're going to have a lot of them, and we do have a lot of them. So we wanted to make sure we built a tool that made it really easy to create these new repositories. And we borrowed, uh, we, so we, we aptly named it Repo Setup, and we borrowed a concept from Maven or others of, of archetypes. And the idea is that when you run this repository setup tool, it prompts you through and asking you what type of repository you want to build. Uh, in this case, we have options of one for security groups, one for VPCs. And I'm going to walk through the VPC example. And it's extensible, so we can continue to add new archetypes. And the idea is that it lays it out with a folder structure and seed files that are particular to those. So I'll show what that looks like for VPCs. It also does things like hook it up to our CI servers, so it's already ready for deployment. So when a team is ready to do a deployment, it's really easy for them to do it. It's kind of a just get going as soon as it's ready. Um, so the first thing it does as part of the repository setup is generates a bunch of modules. And we have a collection of modules that we organize in different ways that we call flavors. Uh, so from a VPC perspective, we have different types of workloads that have different types of VPC layouts. So for example, your web and customer facing applications might look different than an internal data analytics VPC. So we have a couple of classes of these. And what we've done is we have, a, we have a central collection of modules. Like here, you see the VPC, the internet gateway. You see more things like subnets, NACLs. Um, but the idea is, as part of this archetype process, you specify what type of flavor you want to use. And what that ends up doing is it builds the Terraform files with these modules already combined for you. And this way, teams could hit the ground running with these. And from an architectural perspective, we set up our folders such that we put those shared modules in a single folder. Uh, here called VPC modules. So that VPC config Terraform file is where those modules would get loaded. And then what we do is we have a folder for each environment. So the non-prod folder and the prod folder. And what this allows us to do is those just call that shared module. And now our non-prod and prod look the same. And this does require that the shared modules are parameterizable enough that the different environments. So we've spent a lot of time cultivating those. But anytime we need a new, a new VPC, a new security groups, it really lays out in this folder. You're free to change it once you, uh, once you lay it out. But I don't know if I'd advise that, because this is kind of the, the, the processes that we set that work very well. And so this leads to the environment promotion. It's when you want to deploy something, you can easily deploy it to non-prod and then to prod. Um, so that's great. We lay out a repository. But obviously, changes need to get made. So this is where the whole workflow comes in. So typically, the developers and the people who approve the changes are going to be different groups of people. And this allows for that sets of checks and balances. So from a VPC perspective, what we might have is a security team who does a review, or we might have one or more approvers, um, someone from architecture, someone from security. But anyone who wants to make a change is free to do it through a pull request model. Uh, they would fork it like they would any other open source product, fork the repository, make a change, submit a pull request back. But a couple of interesting things happen during the pull request. And this also will talk about some of our other open source tools. Uh, so we do a Terraform validate just to make sure syntactically we're correct. That solves a lot of problems. We generate a Terraform plan. And this is very much for the reviewers to look at, also for the developers. But the reviewers can then see, as I mentioned, exactly what's going to change. Uh, but then this last part is we have an open source product called Cloud Custodian, which I heard was talked about in one of the open spaces here. But if you're, if you're not familiar with it, it's, it's a rules engine that effectively lets you run arbitrary rules against cloud resources. So a specific example might be uh, if we're deploying a security group, we want to make sure that we don't have a CIDR block of slash zero that is not that's you know, an internal application, or what, whatever those rules might be. So depending on the type of VPC or security group we're deploying, we'll have these different rules. And, and these all show up as GitHub status checks. So when the reviewer goes to review it, they can see, did it pass all the automated checks? They can have conversations in this asynchronous way in GitHub. And it lets developers continue to work in an ecosystem that they're familiar with. So it's all about keeping the developers in GitHub and building tools that, that support the review process. And then the approval is simply just a GitHub merge. 
So if a, a team, if the pull request gets accepted, they merge it in. If not, you reject it. Uh, so that's how the change actually gets into our master branch. And the master branch then represents all that is, has been approved. But once it's in here, we still actually need to be able to deploy that change. And that's where the next part of Nimbus comes in, which is the CLI and API to actually do the deployment. And this is where we tried to make it super simple to, for developers and our ops teams. Because you're taking some people from an ops perspective who have worked in traditional operations world writing scripts. And we want to make it really easy. It's a standalone Python application that you run. You just deploy the GitHub repo. And this all ties back into why each repository is our unit of deployment. So you simply just deploy a repository. You can deploy any change to the approved branch. So this way, if you need to roll back to a specific SHA, you can do that. You don't need to go through another pull request in the event that something really bad happens. You get prompted. And then magically, this goes out and deploys. So there's a lot of things that happen behind the scenes here. And this is a bit of a diagram here on what is happening behind the scenes. So when we do this, a few things happen. Uh, the CLI calls our API. And the API first checks, are you actually a collaborator on the repository? And this is how we manage our permissions model. So if you want to deploy a repository, you need to be a collaborator on it. And it's our central group of approvers who decide who can be uh, collaborators. And this makes sure that you can only deploy what you have access to. And so once we validate that you actually are a collaborator, we will then elevate to a privileged user on your behalf that actually has the ability to do these deployments. And what this allows us to do is not give develop, uh, engineering access to do security groups and VPCs to every developer and still make sure we have an audited change. We use the GitHub deployments API here, which then audits all of our changes in there. Uh, that triggers a webhook back to our CI server, which then goes ahead and actually makes the changes. And back to the console, uh, you can actually see that. And to illustrate how easy it was, I noticed about 10 o'clock this morning, we had one of our Capital One developers actually making a change to one of our environments during one of the talks. So it's super easy to do, uh, very distributed. The approving team was somewhere else. Uh, and then we also published the changes to Slack. So a lot of what we're doing here is about trying to make security a lot more transparent. So anybody can see what have we deployed. You can't slip in backdoor changes, permissions, visibility, auditability, all the things that go with making a security team happy. So that's what we've done in terms of tooling. What we're doing next, I think there's a, there's a couple of things we want to do. As our VPC footprint grows to many more hundreds, because we still have a lot of moving out of our data centers to do, we start running into issues about how we do canary deployments of changes. How do we deploy to all of our dev VPCs at once, or a slice of our QA ones, or a slice of our production ones? Because a bad change to even a dev environment can knock out a few hundred, if not more, developers, causing some serious productivity issues. So we want to figure out how to canary that a bit and do it in a bit more parallel. Uh, not something we've done quite yet. So the easier to read version of the Terraform plan. From a developer perspective, easy to use. We've talked about how we've hooked into that for our security groups. But what we would love to do is hook into this for other resource types. So if you make a change, whether it's to a VPC, a subnet, it just generates a nice human readable, whether it's a PDF, a spreadsheet, just something that somebody can read without going into the code. Uh, and many teams like to read that. Expanding to multiple cloud providers, all the archetypes that we've talked about are really specific to AWS. But as I mentioned, there, there's nothing in this process that's AWS specific. And we're also getting more into user interfaces around this product from a visibility perspective. Designing so when, our, when our, some of our team leads or executives want to see what have people done, there's an easy to see view of who's deployed what where rather than running GitHub commands to see. So that's kind of next step of this product. And then just kind of recap what we've done. This is. We aim to get an application that was infrastructure as code. I think we've done that. Very auditable, very secure. And uh, we're, we're pretty happy with the progress and continuing to move forward. So, and that's about it. Thanks a lot. <laughs>